You can't have better without comparison. It is always better compared to who? Better compared to what? right? You can't, better is not a standalone. And so because of that, because of its place as a comparative adjective, there's never an end to better, right? You can always be a little better. (laughs) There's probably someone who's better. So you can always be better than that better. And there's no end to it. there. I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves and enjoy a little chocolate in the process. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. Now, if you have ever struggled with comparison to others, or even your former self, today's episode speaks truth. Oh, so much truth right into your heart, or at least it it did to me. It did to me. Okay, so this is the deal. I don't want to admit I deal with comparison. I would really like to think that I'm past that. And honestly, I've gotten to the point that I don't deal with it as much from like a person to person, body to body perspective. Like I've, I've, come far enough that most of the time I'm not like, oh, well, she's thinner than I am, or she's fitter than I am or anything like that. So I'm most of the time I'm okay with that. But I still fall into this trap of comparing my body to the one I used to have, or maybe comparing my mothering skills, which ebb and flow. (laughs) Sometimes I'm winning, many times I am not. Uh, Or even something as simple as you know, my food photography, which I in my newsletter, I'm like, I am not a food photographer, but I'm going to take a picture of this because it's really good. And then also, like for me personally, uh, this communicator in an online space, this is really hard for me to um, in the comparison and not to not to compare myself with others. So that's why I cannot wait for you to hear from my guest today, Heather Creekmore, you may know Heather from her first book compared to who? which focuses on body image. And then she's written another fabulous book on comparison from all kinds of perspectives and why trying to be better may not be where God wants us. If you don't know Heather, let me tell you a little bit about her. She writes and speaks hope to thousands of women each week, inspiring them to stop comparing and start living. She's been featured on Fox News, Half Post, Morning Dose, Church for Leaders, For Every Mom, along with dozens of other shows and podcasts. But she's best recognized from her appearance appearance as a contestant on the next Netflix hit show, nailed it. Heather and her fighter pilot turned pastor husband, Eric, have four children and live in Austin, Texas. You can connect with Heather at compared to who.me. And then she also has a podcast by the same name, which is really great. So I highly recommend you check that out. I'll have all those links in the show notes. But before we get to Heather, I have wondered or I am wondering if you have joined me yet in breaking some rules. You know, I'm all about rule breaking right now. Some of these stupid, dumb health ones that we've grown up with. So if you would like to uh, join me in breaking some of these so-called rules of healthy living, I would love it if you would go over to gracedhealth.com slash bad rules and get my free download. It combats several health rules we've heard uh, over our lifetime and then gives you you a bonus one to keep. Okay, let's bring on Heather. Heather, I am so glad you are here on the Grace Health Podcast. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Okay, tell me, I always think this is kind of an interesting question, even though it's like super simple. So how has your day gone today? Today has been fairly easy. So yeah, um, I homeschool. So, and we're kind of in the December slump of we should probably be doing something, but it's almost Christmas. So we'll just kind of wing it. So yeah, it's been a pretty easy day so far. Thanks. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, my, um, I do not homeschool. I was not given that gift, (laughs) (laughs) but um, my 
older, my, my kids, like the way that their school does the final exams is they kind of spread them out, which is really nice. I think it's great for them. I think it's great for the teachers because the teachers are like, well, study for your next exam and then they can get those graded. And so it's not hanging over their heads, but yeah, he's kind of been in that funny little or they, but one in particular has been in a little bit of a strange little slump of like the heavy ones were early Mm -hmm. and now he's just kind of coasting on through. Very nice. (laughs) (laughs) So that's great. I was wondering if you could tell my listeners a little bit about um, yourself and then both of your books, because I feel like they kind of, um, I don't want to say one follows, but they kind of capture a lot of the same. I don't know. That's not fair of me either. It's not the same. <laughs> I, you, you want me to explain This it? is not going the way I wanted it to. Let, let me help you out, Amy. <laughs> I'll, I'll pull you out of that hole. Um, no, I'm, it's actually, it's good. You, you were actually accurately describing it and it's hard to describe. It's hard to put words around. So let me put words around it. So yes, um, I'm Heather Creekmore. And um, this is kind of like the start of an AA meeting. Like I write about uh, body image issues because I've had body image issues since the third grade. And honestly, this is the last thing in a million years I would have ever expected to be talking to you or anyone else about. Um, I was raised in a Christian home. Um, I went to Christian schools all the way through graduate school. And so I had things that I wanted to do with my life and none of them included talking about my biggest struggle, which was my body image issues, always thinking I needed to be thinner or prettier or hotter or whatever word you would choose. Um, but a constant treadmill of thoughts in my mind and really a treadmill of activities in my life that really kept me chasing a better body um, instead of chasing God's purpose for my life. And so I am... By the way, you can stop Uh right there. Yeah, I know. Well, I I heard your story and I was like... Well, I think you, you compared to who could be we your story have. too. I mean, I don't know the details, but, but yeah, we're, we're very similar. Oh, yes. So I, um, I didn't get married until I was in my early thirties, 31. I met my husband on eHarmony. So I spent my 20s working in politics and marketing and I had great jobs, but uh, I had one job on the side that I used to define my identity more than any other. And that was I was a fitness instructor. And um, I was probably I mean, I held the title of vice president of my organization at 25 years old, but I was a lot prouder of the fact that I was a kickboxing instructor um, because that was really what concerned me was if people would think I was pretty or in shape enough or all of those things. And so um, in some way, I thought that having that title of fitness instructor gave me that stamp of approval. And um, and so I taught yeah. fitness classes through my late 20s and, and really all through my pregnancies in my 30s after I got married. Um, but what I recognized was even being the best fitness instructor at my gym uh, wasn't enough for me to solve my body image issues. That stamp of approval, if you will, was not actually a stamp of approval. It was it was just another title that didn't mean anything. And um, and so, like I said, I got married, and I thought getting married would solve my body image issues. And instead, I think it made it worse. <laughs> and then I got pregnant and had kids. <laughs> and and so anyway, my story is is I'm a pastor's wife now. I married a Marine fighter pilot who uh, was called out of the military and into the ministry. And um, and we have four children that, like I said before, we homeschool. And um, I write and I speak about all those embarrassing things <laughs> that a lot of women think about in their yeah. heads and don't let out. Unfortunately, I just let them out. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, yeah, so in my first book, Compared to Who, I share my body image struggle and I share the path that God took me on to find a way out, which, Amy, is really similar to yours in the fact that, you know, God showed me that I I had a body image idol. And I don't know if you use those exact words around it when you talk about it, but that you're worshiping the wrong thing. And so, um, yeah. So that's what God showed me. And that's kind of the journey that I lay out in compared to who. And then I had lots of women following me, listening to me saying, okay, I'm good with body image. Uh, what about the way I compare my marriage to other people's marriages? What about the way I compare, you know, my home or my kids or all these other things in life? What do I do about that? We need a book on comparison more generally. I was like, okay, great. I'll do that. I'll write that. Mm -hmm. And then I sat down and I'm like, do I know what the answer is (laughs) to that? 
<laughs> I'm like, huh? Oh yeah, just stop comparing it. Huh? What, how do I tell people to do that? And and it's always been my heart through Compared to Who and even in The Burden of Better, my second book, to not give people cliches. I feel like there are so many memes and cliche little pithy quote answers out there that don't really go to the root or the heart of these issues. And um, and I did not want to just add another book to the collection of, of you know, stuff that's out there that says, just stop. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, so that's, right. that's those two books and a little bit about me. I hope I... Uh, <laughs> I hope I answered all that. That's great. I mean, I have to say in reading through The Burden of Better, um, your words really resonated with me. I mean, there was so much that I, I mean, like just the things that l- our listeners can't see how much I was nodding while you were talking, like just nodding. Yes, 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 yes. And I, <laughs> there's so many things I want to talk about, but that's a little off topic. So we'll just leave that for another time. But I, I really had to laugh. And I think I might have even laughed out loud. You're, you, several times <laughs> you referenced mm-hmm. how much you sweat. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes me too. <laughs> I used to have those pads that you put under your armpits because like in the eighties, yeah, those silk shirts are really popular, but there's no way to get through wearing a silk shirt all day without like big sweat rings. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. Totally. N- me either. And then, and so I'm, I'm like, yeah, me too. Oh yeah. I sweat. I sweat. And then you get to a part that, um, really kind of knocked me off when you were talking about idolizing women Mm -hmm. who don't appear to sweat. And I was like, oh, (laughs) yeah, I've done that too. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's a thing. Like, I, (laughs) and it took me back to a time I was getting a fitness certification. You know, when you're a fitness professional, you have to take all these continuing education. And I was, you know, at a day long thing. And so I don't, I don't, have you ever been to any of those like day long conference or? Well, I, I did the Johnny G spin day long certification way back in the day. What I would do, what I typically do is like, I'll, you know, show up wearing one set of gym clothes and then I'll bring like three pair for the the day. Cause like mm-hmm. you work out and then you sit down and then you work out and then you sit down. And this, this yep. girl I was doing this with, like, she wore the same thing the whole time and she never sweat. And I'm like drenching sweat. So anyway, that's a little side. Uh-huh. Sorry. I will. I'm not going to share all of my stories with you, but I just, I, when you talked about idolizing other, you know, women for, for things that we, um, that we struggle with ourselves. I, I don't know that just kind of, that just kind of rocked my world a little bit, (laughs) Um, which kind of leads me into one of the questions uh, or one of the statements that you said that I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about, because you say, um, I meet many women who share with me this one simple sentiment. I don't compare myself to others. I just compare myself to the self I want to be. Um, and then I might, Amy speaking, have, you know, the other thing I hear of is the body I used to have. Um, mm-hmm. And you call that idealization. Tell me more. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So you might have to cut me off because I'll just keep going. <laughs> but no, I, so, so this is, this is very, very common, I think. And a lot of us convince ourselves that it's not outside pressures that are pushing us to change or be better or, you know, get a better body, all those things that it's just something inside of us. And, and what that something inside of us is, is our idea ideals, right? And and the culture that we live in, in our society, having ideals is praised, right? Like it's good. You have to have a goal. You got to know what you're working for. You put the picture of your idea. Well, it used to be you put it on the fridge. Now I guess you just pin it <laughs> on Pinterest. But I like, I remember, you know, in the eighties and nineties, you cut out the pictures of the women that you wanted to look like and you put them on your refrigerator. And that was supposed to help you like not like eat, I guess. Um, and then like, if you had that image in your mind, all day long, then you would do things to look more like that person. And, and so, you know, as you kind of stop and think about just like even that visual that cutting out the picture of a woman and putting it on your fridge, like it's idolatry. Yeah right? Like you're worshiping that image. You are looking at that picture of that other woman and you are saying, oh, if I had that, it would give me 
joy and peace and satisfaction and, and love and all the things. And it's, it's idolatry. No, there's no statue in your home that you're bowing down to, but, but it's, you've set this image in a place in your heart and in your life where you're saying you will save me looking like you will save me. And so kind of wrapping back to idealism, I think what happens is we come up with this list of, of ways that we think we should be more ideal. So I'll, I'll move off of body image for a second. Just talk about mothering. This is what I talk about in the yeah. book, right? So I knew, so like I said, we got married at 31. I was pregnant shortly thereafter. So as a mother, there are all these things that I was sure I was going to do when I was a mom someday. And, you know, I had my whole 20s to like spend judging <laughs> Other mothers, quite oh candidly, gosh. right? Yes, you know, like oh, well, there's a like, book on how to potty train in one day. You could, if you were a better mom, oh, you could do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all the things, right? And you know, so I knew like what my kids were going to be dressed like, and what they were going to eat, and what we were going to do, and all the things. And then I actually had kids, and that rocked. <laughs> <laughs> my whole world, right? And so, so one of the things that I like to joke about is I was never going to feed my kids like frozen chicken nuggets. Like, you know, that's not real food, right? Um, and so like, there was no way. And I would go to people's homes, like if we were going, you know, out with friends who had kids, they would like throw the frozen chicken nuggets down on the plate for the kid to eat before they went out for the night. And I was like, oh, not going to do that. Oh, no. Like my kids will eat a plate of spinach, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but but now that I'm a mom, like we could not survive without our microwave because my kids eat frozen chicken nuggets yes. <laughs> so yeah. often or frozen taquitos or all the things, yeah, right? We do the frozen so, pre-made burgers. Oh, yes. We have those too. Yes. We have those too. Those are, those are, those are those popular are around here. Saving um, around here. <laughs> exactly. We got to fill them up and that, that's a tough challenge. So I've got a couple choices of what to do. Like I'm not meeting my ideal. Right. My ideal was I was going to be this mom that would stop in the middle of her day and create a fresh and nutritious lunch for my children. And instead of the mom that's like, hey, there's frozen nuggets in the drawer in the freezer, just go grab those. Um, and so I'm letting myself down. And so so what happens with our ideals is because we we depend on them to define to find our identities in some cases, to define whether or not we're doing good or bad, we kind of set up a scale. Am I close to my ideal? Oh, then I'm doing well. Am I far from my ideal. Oh, I'm doing poorly. And then what happens is that that leads to things like shame, right? Mm -hmm. I know I'm not a good mom because I don't feed my kids homemade chicken nuggets. I make them eat the dinosaur shaped ones or, you know, and, and so, and there's ev every area of life this happens in, right? Like I know I, I was going to be the fit mom. I was going to be the thin mom. I was, I hear them all. And we set up this ideal and then we find ourselves tragically disappointed, if not devastated, feeling shame and despair because we haven't met our own ideal. And, and what I, I think is fascinating about this is that, well, it's two, twofold, right? First of all, we convince ourselves that we came up with this ideal all by ourselves, right? And I don't actually think that's true. Um, and I've, I spent a decade in counseling, and so I, I had a very wise man... <laughs> Help me dig deeper into these issues, okay? So I didn't just come up with this myself one day. But I think if we really stop and look back at what our parents praised, what we looked at with, with eyes of admiration as, as children and as teenagers, I think we can find that a lot of these ideals that we set for ourselves actually came from seeing someone or something else through childhood, through the teens, even into the 20s, right? So it's not actually an original idea you had. You read an article somewhere in a teen magazine that made a big impact on you, and that's what made you decide yeah. that thigh gap is the most important thing. Or, or whatever, right? I know thigh gap's not a thing anymore. But I think women who grew up in that era, for Absolutely. them, it probably is still a thing. Like now everyone cares about butts. Like we didn't care anything about butts in the 80s and, and the 90s. Like you didn't want a butt in the 80s, right? right? You wanted no butt at all. And now everyone wants a butt. And it's just hard to keep up with all this stuff. <laughs> but um, <laughs> But so anyway, all of all of these things actually factor into these ideals that we create for ourselves. And then what we do with these ideals is we we form little idols, right? Just like the Israelites did back when Moses went up on the mountain. He was gone for too long. They took their jewelry, they melted it down, and they made golden calves to worship. And as silly as that sounds to us now, I mean, I'm apt to be like... Ugh. 
we're so much smarter than that now. Like those Israelites, like they obviously were not as intelligent as we are because who would do that? But we do the exact same thing. We look at magazine covers and we say, oh, that's that's what I need to worship. That's my ideal. If I could just be that, then I would be happy. I would be free is really what I think it is. And um, and and that's that's where we get caught in idealism's trap. Oh, that's so true and powerful. And I love how you talk about the, sh- the scale of the ideal. And it does. It's like, are we, are we on it? Are we winning? I mean, yeah, I definitely, I mean, I've shared, I think more than once that I used to cut out pictures of um, models that, yeah, and put them on my bathroom mirror. Mm-hmm. And this girl was like probably five, eight and, you know, dark hair and didn't have the body shape that I had. But for some reason, I thought I could do that. Mm. Like I could grow four inches (laughs) on top of everything else. So yeah, I totally, um, I totally agree with that. Thank you for thank you for digging into that with me. Okay, so another thing that you talk about that I love, and I look at it a lot from the fitness standpoint, standpoint, is um, how you should how one should be wary of superlatives, Mm. better, best, fitter, you know, all of the errs and ests and all of that kind of stuff. Um, My hang up is like on the fitness motivation memes. (laughs) because there's a whole, there's a whole lot of that, that I, uh, I take a little bit of issue with. Give us a little guidance in that. Like, is there a litmus test? Is there um, something that maybe we should, when we see these things and think, oh, that's, you know, we, we start falling into, Mm -hmm. oh, I need to do er, est, whatever that, that will help us stop and recognize where that is, and then hopefully turn that around? Sure. Well, so, I mean, so the the, the basic concept, just the, the thing that I think we forget is that better, the word better in the English language is a comparative adjective. So you can't have better without comparison. It is always better compared to who? Better compared to what, right? You can't, better is not a standalone. And so because of that, because of its place as a comparative adjective, like there's, there's never an end to better, right? You can always be a little better. (laughs) There's probably someone who's better. So you can always be better than that better. And there's no end to it. And the same with the same with the superlative, you know, best or greatest or thinnest or hottest, you know, I guess if you feel like you've reached that, then I don't, I don't know. Congratulations. But I just don't think that's possible. Most of us never reach the S, right? We're stuck in the right. er, right? And, right. And, and I think, honestly, I talk to a lot of women and I feel like most women are realistic in, in understanding that, you know, I'm not going to be the hottest anymore. Like maybe I just want to be the hottest in like, I don't know, my community, <laughs> my church or something like that. Not that we would ever say this stuff out loud again, right? Like this is all the secret stuff we think and plot in our heads that no one says out loud except for crazy me. But, um, but you think, you think to yourself, like, I want to be the hottest, you know, the hottest woman at mops (laughs) or whatever, (laughs) right? You won't say that to anyone, but, but it's, but I think realistically, most women are are not actually setting those kind of goals. Instead, they're saying, I just want to be a little better than I am. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and it, Kind of, it just so easily, smoothly, nicely translates into thinking about money, right? Like how much money is enough? Well, just a little more, right? Just a little more. I'll know when I get there, just a little more. And I think that's the same trap we fall into when it comes to body image issues or even like improvement in any area, right? Like couldn't your marriage always be just a little better? Like, couldn't your parenting always be just a little better? Couldn't your home always be just a little better? I mean, I I like to use the analogy of what happens if you start home improvement projects, right? Like you decide to paint a room and it can never just stay there. You paint that room and all of a sudden you're going to notice that your baseboards and your trim and your door, well, they're going to need to freshen up too. And then you get all that done. You got this bright, pretty room. It probably needs new fixtures. And then you got all that done. And like, that's the nicest room in your house. You walk out in the hallway and it's so dingy and dark. You got to paint it too. And now your hallway can, and it, it never stops. Right. And by the time you get your whole house redone, guess what? Gray is no longer a popular color. We're back to Brown and you're going to have to redo everything else. Right. I right. mean, <laughs> you never arrive and it's the same with our bodies. Right. Like I, and I, I think the whisper is if you could just lose, if you could just lose 10 pounds, wow, you'd feel 
good then. Oh, you, oh, you'd be awesome. You could just lose that 10 pounds, Ugh, you know, just, just once and for all, just get rid of that 10 pounds. But what happens is you lose that weight and maybe it's 10, maybe it's 50 pounds. And I know women have lost a hundred pounds and still say they've had the same struggle. You lose that weight. And what happens? Well, maybe you got extra skin if you lost a lot of weight, right? Or even if you don't have the extra skin, you lose the weight and it's like, oh, well now I look a little bit, I mean, for me, I lose weight and it comes out of my chest. <laughs> I go down like a bra size or two, right? Well, that's not ideal, you know, um, or, you know, or your, your face starts to look more thin and, oh, you know, and now I need to do something to make my face look, you know, more like a magazine cover or boy, I never noticed how flat my hair is, you know, so now I got to do something to get my hair and it, it's never ending. There is always something else you could do to improve yourself. And so that's where we get caught in the, in the rabbit hole of better. There will always be better and better is always happy to let us chase it. And I think, I think as believers, as followers of Jesus, we have to stop and we have to ask ourselves, is that the better that he wants us to chase? Is that the better that he wants to consume us? So you ask for practical strategies not to fall in that hole. I think the practical strategy is to follow the treasure principle that Matthew sets up for what we do with money and what we do with our treasure, right? So where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So how do you know where your heart is? Well, you look at where you're spending your money and where you're spending your time. And when I talk about time, I don't just mean actual time spent because some of us only work out for 30 minutes a day or you know, 30 minutes, three times a week. But in our heads, we are thinking about, I should be working out. I should go work out right now. I should. It, we spend an hour or two a day just thinking about how much more we should be working out or an hour or two a day thinking about our calorie intake or what we ate. And our thought life can be completely consumed with our bodies and what we look like and all the things. And so that kind of reveals where our treasure truly is. You know, Heather, that's something just between you and me. <laughs> and everyone listening. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something I have really struggled with in my whole graced health space, because part of my story is I was, you know, God kind of came to me and he didn't kind of, he did come to me and said, you're spending more time thinking about the, the food you're going to eat and the exercise you're going to do than you are thinking about me. And so that really kind of started to pull me out of that space. Well, now here I am mm -hmm. in a space where I talk about health. And I'm, and I'm talking about food and I'm talking about exercise and I'm, you know, and I'm videoing exercises and I'm taking pictures of food and, and it's all consuming. Mm -hmm. And that's the space he's called me into, but I've, I have struggled with that balance of where is my heart with this and how am I, I mean, I spend a lot of time and energy talking about health because that's where he's called me, yeah. but I don't want it to be where it's taking it off of him. Absolutely. There's a great quote, and um, and I think it's from Sir Thomas Chalmers. He was a Scottish minister in the 1800s, and it's, what you think about in your solitude is your religion. And that oh. quote just kind of stopped me dead in my tracks when I first started doing this because I was like, wow, what I think about when I'm alone <laughs> is how to change my body. <laughs> like if, yeah. you know, not that I talk about it, not that anyone would have known that's what consumed my thoughts at all. Like my college friends were completely like flabbergasted when they read my first book. And I talked about how much I worried about all that stuff in college. They had no idea. I didn't talk about it. We don't, but it consumed my thought life. And, but I think now, um, so the word balance is, is really popular and I think helpful in some areas, but I think as believers and followers of Jesus, it's more important that we look at life through the lens of priorities and order. God lays out an order. There's a food chain, right? There's an order to the seasons. There's an order to our days. The Bible tells us that he's lined up our days in order, right? And so what I think is helpful and keeps us from kind of falling into that pit again is, is just keeping things rightly ordered, right? If we keep God as our first treasure, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with thinking about, oh, should I eat ice cream tonight for the 17th night in a row or should I not? Like, that's, that's 
that's okay. You're not sinful for having that thought or, or thinking about what workouts you're going to do. Like, but it's just keeping things in proper priority um, and, and just monitoring, okay, where's my treasure? What am I thinking about? What's consuming me the most? Um, just keeping mm-hmm. that in check, I think is really, um, really helpful. And, and also remembering, because I would be remiss if I didn't say this there are areas that we're all always going to be tempted in. And I think for women that struggle with body image, this is the area the enemy knows he's going to tempt us in. It just is. Right. And so, right. so the, tr- I would be a liar, like liar, liar, pants on fire. If I got on there, I was like, I don't struggle at all anymore. Oh no, that's, that's a lie because I am tempted in that area. Most of all, if, if on the corner of my screen right now, an ad for diet pills that for thirty nine ninety five could, you know, take 10 pounds off me with no diet or exercise, like it's going to be hard for me not to get my credit card out <laughs> and buy those suckers. Right. <laughs> because I, that's my temptation. My temptation is the quick fix, the miracle cure. And so that's, and and then, and then beyond that, my temptation is I get on the scale and I hear the voice of you'd be happier if you were 10 pounds thinner. So, so the cure is not that you're never going to be tempted again. The cure is you're going to know what to do when you face that temptation, you know, how to stand up to that temptation, how to, how to see it, discern it rightly as temptation and, and how to fight back. I agree. And I think to add on to that, It's a really easy way to get us distracted from whatever it is that God is calling us to do. Absolutely. Because when, when we are filled, you know, when the enemy fills our minds with all of these desires of better, thinner, um, fitter, whatever that is, it's, it's really easy to get our mind off of, you know, the, the purpose and the calling that God has for us that moment, that afternoon, that day you know, whatever that is, I talk some about micro and, you know, lots of different kinds of callings. But yeah, I think it's distraction for sure. Absolutely. For sure. And it took me a long time to kind of identify that. Okay, so kind of on the other side, not at the other side of the coin, but you really challenged me in something that you wrote, I had to I had to sit with it for a little bit. Um, You talk about how culture, culturally, we have made a new idol out of being imperfect. Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> so how can we show our imperfections? I mean, you know, like I have actually for a while, my Instagram bio was, I'm not perfectly curated and neither is this feed. So I was mm-hmm. like, I'm just putting it all out there. And I do believe in that. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of things that I do that are intentional about like, I am not trying to come across polished at all, but we don't want to idolize that process and we don't want to idolize being imperfect. So help us through that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, I, I love authenticity. I mean, I, I really believe that that's, that's what I'm called to as well. Um, I wrestle with social media because I feel like I don't want to show you a bunch of perfect, pretty pictures that someone set up and took of me um, in my social media feed because I don't think that's helpful, <laughs> especially, you know, especially since my women are women who struggle with comparison and body image. I'm like, I just don't know if showing you more pictures is is really, you know, that's not really where it should be. Um, but I do, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I got frustrated with this whole thing a couple years ago when um, the whole concept of a beautiful mess came out. And that was, I think it was the mops theme. And I do a lot of talking at mops groups. And so that was the mops theme. And, and I was like, well, the problem is, yes, we are all a mess. But it's not our mess that's beautiful. It's actually how God can use our mess and what God does to our mess. That's what's beautiful. So to live in the mess and glorify the mess and glorify the imperfect and, and basically create the imperfect, really create a new idol of imperfection as, as, because that's, I think what a lot of women do. I don't, I don't think it's what you did, but I do think there is a a culture of, of I'm going to show you how imperfect I am and then you're going to love me more. Um, And, and, you know, again, that's, that's just as, just as disingenuous as let me show you how perfect I am. So you'll love me more. Right. So I, I do think we just have to be careful about glorifying our mess and instead be really clear that, yeah, I am a mess, but praise God, he takes this mess and he makes something beautiful out of it. Absolutely. I think that's a really great point. And it's what God can do through the mess. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic one. 
Um, okay, so you share a story in your book, The Burden of Better, about being in a hotel lobby with clothes that you just threw on. I mean, this is 100% the way that I travel, <laughs> like throwing on the gym short or, you know, the gym clothes and throwing up the hair and no makeup, much to my mother's. Uh-huh. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, gosh. Mine too. Uh, <laughs> and you see a woman in a green dress. So mm-hmm. I'm actually going to let you take that from yeah. there because I don't want to mess up the story. But if you can you share that story with us? Because I think it was so powerful. Absolutely. Well, yeah. So I'll set, I'll set the context even more. So my husband had just taken a new job um, in Austin, Texas. And so we were traveling just to meet him. So we we're kind of doing this whole like stay in a hotel for a weekend so we can be with dad and then we go home and, and stuff. And so literally I had on Capri yoga pants, a t-shirt, a black dressy cardigan sweater that I had brought to wear to church the day before. Um, but it was freezing. And that was the only kind of coat thing I had. And so I have on this dressy sweater and my capri pants and a t shirt. And I was just I was not looking very good. But the kids were starving. And you know, I was like, who cares? They're just going to the hotel lobby for breakfast. And so I get all their plates set. And I'm sitting there feeling like, you know, <laughs> feeling like someone's going to approach me for, you know, being homeless with my four children or something because <laughs> of the way I'm dressed. And this woman walks in and she's just dressed perfectly. She had on this green dress and shoes matched. And she was just a stunning woman um, and just impeccably dressed, just just looked perfect. And so she came in and she set her stuff down on a table and got up to get her food. And I was just watching her the whole time. I mean, I'm glad she didn't seem to notice because I was really staring her down. <laughs> I'm like, you know, <laughs> and, you know, you do the like whole like you're comparing yourself, right? And you're trying, and this is why I'm writing uh-huh. a book on comparison. So go figure. Um, and but you're trying to figure out you know, trying to figure out what her story is, you know, what does she have planned today that she's dressed like that, that sort of thing. And so I hear God's prompting, you know, tell her she looks nice. And like, I'm having this internal, completely inaudible, like dialogue with the Lord in my head where I'm, why would I do that? God, that's ridiculous. She looks nice. She obviously knows she's one of those, like she's hot and she knows it. She doesn't need me like homeless looking person (laughs) to to tell her she looks nice. Like that's not even like a compliment at this point, right? Coming from me and the way I look. Um, (laughs) But he's just not relenting. He's just saying over and over again, tell her she looks nice. Tell her she looks nice. So one of the kids needed a napkin. And I get up and I walk by her table. And I mean, I, I almost, I mean, I'm not even sure if I fully stopped at the table, <laughs> but you know, I'm going to be obedient. So I kind of just like walk by and I'm like, you look really nice and kept going. <laughs> and, and then she said something. And so I stopped and she said, wow, thank you. You didn't, you don't know how much I needed that. And right then and there, I think tears welled up in my eyes because I was so broken. I'm going to get emotional about it right now. I was so broken over the reality that I know after working with women for so many years, like I know that most of the time it's the woman that looks like she has it all together, that looks that way because she feels like she's falling apart on the inside. Because I was that woman for a lot of years where no one would have ever, you know, dared approach me thinking that I had any kind of body image issues because I always carefully curated my outfit. My makeup was just right. My hair was just right. I mean, there's no way anyone would have, you know, assumed anything other than I had it all together the way I looked physically. But on the inside, I was just a mess and on this treadmill of I need to be better. I need to be better. And so anyway, that moment, God just really showed me once again, um, that, well, first of all, it's not, it's not the woman that has all together. (laughs) that doesn't need encouragement. She needs encouragement too. But second, beyond that, just how much we need each other, right? We need to be each other's cheerleaders and we need to not withhold the compliments because we feel like that other person is ahead of us in some sort of imaginary race of who's thinnest or who's prettiest or who's hottest, right? Like, like that's ridiculous. Like that's not, God hasn't called us to a life of, of comparing ourselves in some sort of fictional beauty contest, right? Like we, we need to be encouraging and supporting each other and, and, and doing it with our words. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's the story. That's, that's kind of what God, God showed me through all that. Well, I loved that story. And I felt like that almost just embodied the essence of the whole book, like just the, you know, the, where we're comparing ourselves with someone else. And then we step through that Mm. and we, you know, and we go through wherever God prompts us to do. And then we, 
that fills, you know, in this case, it filled her up, right? Like it touched her and and then, and then in turn, it filled you. And I think that that's just the blessing of being encouraging, of being positive and supportive and giving those little, you know, you look nice today or whatever that is, uh, that you never, you just never know. You never know where, uh, what, where people, what people need, what people need. Okay. So I was, um, I kind of have a love hate relationship with Facebook, but I am on it. And (laughs) I saw a post. This was just a personal friend. Like I know her IRL and she posted something that I thought was so vulnerable and brave. And, uh, so I'll read it to you. And then I would, I would love for you to respond to it. She says, I am trying to be the best mom I can. However, Whenever I feel like I'm doing a good job, I look at Facebook and I'm reminded that I'm falling Mm. short. How can there be so many perfect Mm. moms? I'm not a super emotional person, but I kind of want to cry at this because it, like I said, it was so brave. And at the same time, you know, it's just like when we were growing up and teachers would say, if you have a question, Mm. ask it, because if you're thinking it, then probably everyone else is too. And I thought, she's not the only one. I mean, there's so so many women who feel this. So what, what encouragement would you give to her? Would you? Yeah. Give to her? Wow. Um, no, I mean, she's not alone. And I mean, and I think that is the danger of social media, right? And, and it, yeah. that goes to the cliche of you can't compare your behind the scenes of someone else's highlights reel. But I kind of hate that cliche. I hate that quote, because I truly believe that sometimes you can see someone else's behind the scenes and your real life is still worse than their behind the scenes. So like, it doesn't actually help mm-hmm. you, right? But <laughs> but you know there is there is a challenge of social media telling us a story that's not true. And so what I think there's there's two cures for this. The first cure is we never will be enough. We will never be better. We will never reach best status if that's what we're going for if we are completely focused on ourselves all the time. You know, it's just that person who is constantly looking in the mirror harder, longer, you know, staring more and more and more to, you know, see if she's actually beautiful. But what happens when you actually stare in that mute in that mirror longer, harder, like you start to find imperfections, right? And the more you stare, the longer you stare, you don't ever walk away like, wow, like, whoo, I'm. I look good today. I got no, it. The longer yeah. you stare in that mirror, the more you find, ooh, that's a new, you know, that's a new wrinkle. Or- well, I'm you're talking about this and I'm thinking about my magnifying mm-hmm. mirror and all I'm like, oh, and uh-huh. there's a pimple and there's Where a Where did that hair head. come from? <laughs> How long has that been there? It's <laughs> yeah. two inches long. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and so, so I think that's actually what happens though, metaphorically, when we're trying to be the best, we are so uber focused on whatever that thing is that we're trying to succeed in, that instead of seeing where we are actually having success or doing well, all we see are the ways we are falling short. And and I think, and, you know, I'll segue into, um, into of the verse I wanted to share, if that's okay. The Apostle Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians, he kind of talks about his resume. And this is a pretty famous part of scripture. A lot of women that are familiar with the Bible are probably familiar with Paul, like, given his resume with like, you know, how, you know, he's got the right uh, lineage, the right heritage, you know, he's educated correctly. Like he's, he's got all these things. And then he says he counts it all as like dung, which, you know, some people translate to even like the swear word for poop. Okay. Like, so he's, he's being really emphatic that, that his resume means nothing to him. But then right after that in first Corinthians four, three, and I'll just read the verse for you. And I'll read it from um, the ESV. And it says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any court. And so what he's saying is, I don't care what you think of me. And I don't care what your court thinks of me. But then he says something really fascinating. In fact, 
I do not even judge myself. And then in the next verse, he goes on to say that only God judges him. Now, I don't judge myself. Like, so in our culture, like that gets really fuzzy, right? Like the whole judging thing gets fuzzy. Like, do we judge? Do we not judge? Christians shouldn't judge. Christians should judge. You know, it's like, oh, all the culture wars. But but let's let's back away from all of that and all of those definitions of judgment. And let's just think about what Paul's saying. He's saying, I don't, the New Living Translation says, I don't even trust my own judgment of myself. Okay. And so, so what happens is, and this ties nicely back to our ideals, but what happens is we set up this measuring system, our own sort of ruler, our own sort of like list of rights and wrongs by which we can judge ourselves, right? I know I am a good mom. If I, back to my example, if I don't feed my kids, frozen chicken nuggets. I know I am a good mom if I do crafts with my children. I know I am like the best mom if, I don't know, we we learn a second language together while doing, making our own wreaths and eating nutritious food or whatever kind of craziness you have in your head, right? But, right. but you have this list of ideals, this list of things that you think you have to accomplish in order to essentially make yourself happy, right? right? These ideals are not what God asked of you, right? This, this is not a list that God gave you. You know, Amy, I need you to feed your kids this and I need you to, you know, do this every day. No, this is not what God asked. This is just a completely separate thing. And I think the truth of what Paul's saying here is that, that these judgments we set up for ourselves are different than the judgments that God sets up for ourselves. And guess what? They're not as important as the judgments, as God sets up for ourselves. In fact, most of us like, uh, you know, cringe to hear this, right? Because this, this hurts to hear. And so I'm sorry if you're listening today, this, this might hurt a little. Okay. But, but what you think of you is not as important as what God thinks of you. Right. And, and for a lot of us, we get that mixed up, right? Like, yeah, I know God loves and accepts me, but I will accept me more when I lose the weight, get this firm body, you know, get this thing to happen in my life, reach this success, you know, status symbol point, right? But, but that's not the truth of scripture. And, and so really what happens yeah. in that whole messy equation and what maybe it sounds like is happening for your friend is we set ourselves and our opinions of ourselves up as an idol, right? What I think about me matters most. Ooh, no. And that is so hard to admit because as, I mean, those of us who are, are Christ followers too, like we know that that's not what he is wanting us to do. And we know, I mean, we've, we've read Exodus, like we get it, but it is, and it's so hard to admit that. Um, so I just, I guess yeah. I just want to throw that in and I, you're nodding your head. I mean, you know, for those who are like, Ooh, I don't know, do, I'm not, a right. idol, I, you know, or I'm, I don't, you know, create idols. Um, but I think we do. I mean, kind of going back to what you were talking about with where's our, where is our time? Where's our energy? Where are our thoughts? And it is, it's a good, it's a good gut check, a good litmus chat test. Be because I think our culture tells us. Yeah. That making yourself happy is what's most important. Don't worry about making other people happy, right? Mm -hmm. Make yourself happy. Mm -hmm. Are you happy? That's what's most important. Are you doing the things that you want to do? That's what's most important. And ooh, boy, we let that message seep in from everywhere, but that's not what the word of God tells us. Like we don't, and, and it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's super hard truth. I, I hate that I have to be the one to deliver such hard truth sometimes, <laughs> but, but, it, but, it, but we need the wake up call of, we have, I, I don't, it's kind of like, um, so I homeschool, like I said, and I have a list of things that my children have to do every day. Okay. If my child comes to me and he's like, Oh yeah, I know your list, mom. But I have this list of things that I want to accomplish today. And look, I'm doing pretty good. I've accomplished like half of the things that I want to accomplish for today. Um, so I'm doing great, right? Because I feel pretty good about the fact that I've gotten half of my list done. I'm going to be like, no, dude, <laughs> I asked you to do these things. How are you doing on this list? And, and you know, and again, my son's like, but mom, I feel really good about my list. No, I'm sorry. That's not the metric we use in this house. And I think for us as Christians, we have to remember, no, God doesn't really care about your list. <laughs> like At the end of the day, he wants to know how you're doing on his list. Not that he doesn't have 
purpose for your life that's fantastic and and you were uniquely created for it and all those good things he wants you to work for your good and his glory like all that good stuff he loves you beyond what you could ever imagine but your list is just that it's your list it's not as important as his that's a really great analogy. I think everyone, especially those with teens, because most of my listeners are, yeah, kind of have that teen, um, or many of my listeners have have the teen age children. And yeah, I, I'm sitting here going, uh huh, uh huh, uh, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> we have we have had differing lists, <laughs> differing <laughs> priorities that uh, didn't that are not, yeah, that we did not give them. Oh my gosh. Um, Heather, this was such a great book and such a wonderful conversation. And the other thing that maybe you intended to do this, um, you know, you have all of these action steps at the back of every chapter, Mm -hmm. which are really nice. I know people really like resources and how can I apply this? And as I was reading this, I thought, God, this would be so good to do with another, like in a Bible study with a group of women. So I just want to put, I mean, I assume that that was one thought you had with that. Absolutely. So I believe, so you know what, I think I gave you one point and then you can give you the second point, oh, but this yeah. is a nice segue for my second point because my second point for your Facebook friend uh-huh. is, is community, yeah. right? If we just live our lives and it's been hard in the COVID season, but if we just live our lives only knowing about other people from what we see social media, it is super easy to get sucked into believing that everyone's doing better than you are and no one has the problems that you have, right? But when you're in community and you really get to know other women, that's when you start to see, oh, huh, they kind of have struggles too. Yeah. I mean, in my first book, I told the story about a friend of mine who was like a size zero, did modeling, and she invited me over to go to the pool with her. And I was like, oh, Lord, help us. You know, she's 10 years younger than I am and wearing a little black bikini. And I'm like, you know, I think I was maybe a year postpartum with my after my fourth child and still wearing my maternity bathing suit. But, you know, I, I knew her. Mm-hmm. And I knew her heart. Yeah. And I knew that she still struggled. Yeah. And 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 so and that made that whole experience different because I didn't objectify her anymore. I didn't just look at her as like a, you know, a model or a, you know, person on a piece of paper or, you know, I didn't objectify her anymore. I knew I knew who she was. And so I think community is so important. Accountability is so important. So yes, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. I designed this book for you. If you want to read it alone first, read it alone, get an idea, and then grab a couple copies and get a couple friends together. Because these are issues that women struggle with their entire lives and don't have enough women to talk to authentically about it, right? We say things we, you know, we get in the like, who's fatter contest. Like, you know, someone says something negative about their body. It's like, oh, I feel fat. Oh, you're not fat. I'm fat. And we kind of like, who's the bigger ogre kind of contest is the only conversation we have about these issues. And we need to cut all that out. And we also need to stop like just giving each other cliches like, oh, well, it's what's on the inside that counts. Like that's never helped any woman ever. (laughs) Um, Right. And so we need to we need to cut all that out and get to the root of these issues and, and be in community with women that can help keep us accountable to biblical truth and help us find freedom so we can just enjoy our lives and be out there and live for what. God has called us to do. Oh, amen. That is so good. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, I have just a couple more questions yeah. that'll go a little bit uh, a little bit quicker. First of all, you talk some about chocolate, dark or milk? Dark, absolutely, one hundred percent dark. <laughs> yes, but milk, too. if I'm out of dark, <laughs> I'm not that picky. <laughs> I almost, yeah, no, dark, yeah, dark, dark, definitely with some big old sea salt chunks on it. Oh, me. yes, and caramel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. And the, this is another question I've been asking uh, my guests recently. I am fascinated by tattoos. I think they're very interesting. Oftentimes people who choose to have them have uh, really great stories. So I was wondering if you have a tattoo, would you mind sharing what it is uh, and if it has any meaning? And if you don't, if you had to get one, what would it be and where would you put it? Hmm, no, I don't have one. I'm sorry. I'm boring. <laughs> I, I don't either. That's the thing. Like I'm asking all these people, like, what do you have? I'm like, I don't have one. <laughs> but, but so what's funny is um, it's two of the, one of the couples from Duck Dynasty. Um, and I can't remember which brother it is, but he and his wife have tattoo wedding rings. 
Oh. And so my husband was in the Marine Corps, so he's a military guy, but he doesn't have any tattoos either. And so we have always, every time we pass a tattoo parlor, we always talk about going in and getting tattoo wedding rings. Uh, yes. Probably never going to happen. <laughs> but that's the only thing we talk about. <laughs> no, that's great. Because especially, um, you know, when you were active and like, I take my rings off to sleep. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that would be I, I love that answer. So there you go. <laughs> that's great. Okay, anything, uh, any last words that are just burning on your heart that I did not get a chance to talk about today? Hmm burning on my heart. No, but I tell you, I, I, I always like to encourage women that you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. And, and if you're stuck in these issues, it can feel like for me, I was stuck in it for decades. And so it can feel like there's, there's really no way out. This is just, I, I assumed this was the way every woman on the planet thought and processed and that I was just normal, stuck with normal girl problems because I was female. I was going to always have these issues. And, and so my encouragement would just be that there is, there's hope and just take one step at a time, um, in the right direction, um, away from that body image, beauty idol, whatever it is, or whatever idol it is that that's capturing your attention. I tell you, freedom feels really good. It feels really good to not have a constant conversation in my head about calories and exercise and all those things. It feels good to be free to engage in these things in a healthy way. I still love exercise. Um, and yeah. you know, I love good food. And then I also know that there's certain foods I have. I have a lot of health issues, honestly, from my years of, of over dieting and over exercising. It gave me some adrenal issues and I have thyroid issues. And I'd really love to find the research to show that it's all connected. But from, from what I've, from what I understand from doctors, it is. So there's, there's hope that that would be my bottom line. There's, there's hope to start, start taking yeah. steps in the right direction. Okay. Just I'm thinking about our conversation and I feel like she gave us so many great nuggets of wisdom. And as I think about it, I think her words of engaging in a healthy way really resonates with us. You know, there, God has given us all of these emotions and um, goals and thoughts. And a lot of times it's, it's not necessarily the emotion or goal or thought that may or not be best, you know, what's best for us or not best for us, but it's what we take with it and what we do with it in our heart and uh, where we're placing that in relation to uh, where where we're, you know, our attention of God. I don't hope, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. But anyway, she's, I've just kind of been mulling a lot of the things that she's been sharing um, around in my head. I hope you will too. And I really encourage you to go out, get her book, The Burden of Better. Uh, You will probably underline it as much as I underline mine. Hey, if you don't get my monthly journals, I invite you to sign up for them over at gracedhealth.com slash monthly dash journals. This is my way of sharing all kinds of different things with you like recipes and food hacks, workouts, music, so much more. And it's only available to those who sign up. I don't put it anywhere else on the interweb. So it's only for my special graced health community, which I would love for you to be a part of. And by the way, if you I would love to hear what stood out to you. So head over to the Graced Health Community Facebook page, I've got the link in the notes. And let us know, you know, what stuck out with you? What are you thinking about? Okay, in every episode, I like to leave you with one simple thing to remember, because I know there's a lot. And I have to admit, it's really hard for me to pull out one main thing out of the conversation. But I'm really challenging myself to consider what just a little more means in my life. And what's my heart behind it. And then learning to engage in all the things that we talked about in a healthy way that you know, engaging in a healthy way. Um, And that when we get there is freedom without just a little more. Okay, that is all for today. Go out there and have a great day. 